Hello, this is Decoherent, and welcome back to some more Torment Tides of Numenera. So, when we last left off, at the end of an extremely long episode, we had a whole bunch of stuff going on here. So, we talked to Mapper, we came and found Metkina, who, although she seems pretty deadly, what with the whole playing with knives bit, is definitely a few fries short of a Happy Meal, if you know what I mean. So, we got to poke around in some of her past memories, or, I'm sorry, the ones of her friend, actually, the one that she thought, um pulled part of her memory apart and did whatever. So we went and did that, and we discovered that they had visited this weird village that was under attack or something, and we had to go get, I uh, can't remember what it was called, the ocarina or whatever, um, from this sealed doorway, but we couldn't let the bad guy take it because apparently they're shapeshifters of some kind, so they would revert to the, like their bestial forms and whatever. So we screwed around at the past and came back, and she regained part of her memories and showed us a few things on the map and a secret hideout from I believe the Valley of the Dead King or the Valley of the Dead Heroes, but I'll have to double check that. We're not going there today, so that's okay. Ah I think that's it. So let's see kind of where this updated our thing. So on the Builder's Trail. Mile of S, that's right. That is the sanctuary. You can hire a ship. Right. Yeah, so I'm thinking what we might want to do. I still haven't figured out who the leader was, and I've been trying to think about that, but nothing has really come to me. So since Saria, who was one of the first people that um, that we figured out, like pushed her out of her mind, we don't really know where she's gone. So what we're going to want to do, I think, is go back and talk to the ghost again and see if we can get some new clues. It's a little irritating. The easiest way to do it is to go to the crossroads and look in the wrong mirror and die. The problem is, although you can teleport back out from the crossroads, it's kind of a hike in. So, I don't know. We'll go do it. So, Circles in Red said that we should maybe go talk to someone in the Dender or her. Eh, maybe. Let's see, Medkina denied her involvement. She might have more to say if I described the scene of a murder in detail, or if she sees it for herself. Didn't I do that? Well, let's look around her room quick. The hole in the corner is huge, almost two meters across. It was clearly carved, but not by human hands. It leads into a dark tunnel. You know that it was dug by the Stitcher, and it leads to the underbelly. Oh, that's neat. What else do we have going on around here? These clay containers smell of cheap wine and spoiled food. A dirty wash basin sits atop a pool of stagnant water. Okay, and that's how we go back up. Not it. You don't mind if I look through your stuff, do you? Didn't think so. Good. Father Teller. A small polished disc that looks like a handheld mirror, but anyone who looks into it sees an image of their father, or their species equivalent, looking back at them, mirroring their every move. When you hold it, though, all you see is your own face. Oh, that's cool. Which makes sense. A tunnel once led in the direction, but the ceiling has collapsed. Of course it has. Okay, so where does this go? Mind if I do. The final words of countless men and women are scrawled upon the stone walls. Some apologize to loved ones, while others rage against an injustice or slight. A few left only their names. Is this another exit down here? Oh, is this the one that leads us out to that place I couldn't find and get really mad at? Ah, I think so. Yes. Let's just go poke our heads out real quick, and then we'll come right back. Right. So I want to talk to Mekina a little more. Especially since the journal sounds like I didn't do a terribly great job describing things to her. But this area has been bothering me for like 20 episodes, so we're going to look real quick. Because of course we are. Yes! Look out below. Ooh, there's all sorts of stuff. Sideways! From this height, you can see everything. Beyond the city of Sagus Cliffs, bluffs and chasms extend towards the horizon on either side for at least 50 kilometers. The sea stretches between them, perhaps 20 kilometers across at its widest. Then the waters shallow and widen to the horizon. Or, I'm sorry, widen and swallow the horizon. It jump off the ledge. Eh, let's look down first. The tiers of Sagus Cliffs spread out to your right, a jumble of streets and buildings. To the left is the opening of a dark chasm. Exits are north and east, but blocked by a spectral wolf. Tendrils of flesh cling to the edges like vines. Tendrils of flesh? 
Hmm. The ocean lies almost a thousand meters beneath you, dark and dangerous. Scavenging and fishing sloops crawl slowly across its surface. The rooftops of a few Sagus homes jut from the cliff's surface, but it's mostly a clear drop to the sea. You realize you're standing in a shallow depression worn away by more than just weather. The ground and the lips of the ledge are worn smooth from human traffic. Thousands must have come here over the centuries, looking at the sea and contemplating their own demise. Hmm. Not jumping down. Stop asking stupid questions. Are these all the same? I'm going. Right. Yes. What is this? A sheer cliff rises above this ledge. Its surface is rough and jagged. There are enough climb holds that it looks climbable, but it wouldn't be easy. Really? Can't go any further here, huh? Oh, I gotta do it. Don't be ridiculous. Speed, okay. Oh, shoot. Let us go ahead and level some people up first. Okay, so... <sighs> Rin. Rin is super worthless. Unfortunately. She has terrible hit points. Well, four at the moment, which is even worse. Um, the only thing I had for her was a light melee weapon. I swear that I had some ranged weapons, but I couldn't seem to find them. I guess I didn't look through here super carefully. A whole bunch of stuff I can go sell. Yeah, but no ranged weapons. Alright, maybe I don't. So I was thinking of kind of building her up that way. I don't know. Honestly, she kind of sucks. Okay, let's improve a skill. Does that include... It does not include anything ranged. <sighs> Do I give her some more health so she doesn't immediately fall over if anyone looks at her? Healing, lore, perception, running, machinery, natural, quick fingers. I don't need any of these. Let's, I guess, increase your stat pool. Let's give you one point in might. Oh, I can't? Oh, man. What am I going to do with you, kiddo? Oh, we're growing. Hmm. Alright, so let's poke at me here. So I have my choice of all of these here. I think I'm going to increase my edge. Because that's sort of like free stat pool. Because we get it on every roll. Um, I'm already at 3 effort. I don't have any skills that I'm super concerned about. Let's see if I have any new abilities that I care about. Oh, Flash! Didn't I already learn this? Yeah, Flash. Oh, here we go. Dealmaker and Inspiring Presence. That's right. So yeah, I'm going to go ahead and let's increase edge, and we're going to increase it on it since we're playing I learn that? caster, more or less. Okay, now let's try to climb this, because what could possibly go wrong? So who's my speedy? 70%? Do I drain it all the way? Um, let's go 90. Surely that's good, right? And don't call me Shirley. The cliff face is deceptive. Holds that look like they'll crumble in your hands stay firm, while southern looking protrusions crumble like they were made of sand. With careful planning, though, you make it all the way to the top. Am I going to have to roll every time I climb this? Neat! A welcome blast of wind caresses your face at the top of the cliff. Your companions follow the path you blazed for them. Neat! Learning begets doing. Or is it the other way? Shush. Fine. Giant blue force field? The best thing to do is obviously poke it as hard as you can. Most of the cliff top is obscured by a dome of energy. When you get close to it, the air hums and makes your hair stand on end. Let's try to see what's inside the dome. The air sizzles as you get closer, popping across your skin like invisible jumping beetles. When you are within arm's reach, a control interface appears in the air in front of you. It has a glowing circle with strange symbols floating at the edges and a vertical bar next to it. When you step back again, the interface disappears. Whatever energy forms this dome is completely opaque. You can't see anything through it. Oddly though, you can see the shadows of the cliffs and birds on the other side. Hey look, this must be the bloom thingy. Let's study the interface. Oh wait, 
Do I do that, or do I just use the interface directly? Because I, like, have one intelligence point left. Well... Are any of you guys... Obviously, you're no good at this. Okay, I'm gonna use... Your stat pool, because I may need to do some casting stuff. The circle is likely a place to put one's hands or face. Probably the former, since the heat from the dome might burn your face. Presumably, someone with the proper authority could open the dome by using the holographic bar on the side as a kind of latch. The symbols around the circle are unfamiliar, suggesting this insulation is very old, perhaps predating the truth. Whoever created this dome, then, wanted to keep what was inside a secret from anyone except those to whom he or she had given access. Well, I'm not going to touch it. Let's see if I can poke at the interface. As soon as you place your hand in the circle, the symbols light up and spin rapidly. Apparently you have the authority to enter. You slide your other hand up the bar on the side. The interface disappears. The air cools immediately, and the dome fades until it is gone entirely. Ooh. That's cool. Okay. Ah, oh, yeah, look at that thing. That's super gross. Wow. Okay, there's something over here to loot. War mask. This mask appears to be made of wood, yet it feels like cold metal to the touch. When you put it to your face, you hear the sound of war drums beating in the distance. Why did you do that? What on earth would make you think that was a good idea? Eyes of the Finite. So Grant's Sucker Punch. Ah, this was really key, I think, when we were fighting the Miasma a couple episodes back because conveniently it stunned all of them, so that was neat. This is a small glass plate fashioned into a pin, though it can hardly be called a fashion item, as a crowd of otherworldly eyes competes to look out through the glass into the curious world that you inhabit. The eyes reveal weaknesses in foes, especially those already weakened. Yeah, let's take that. Fair enough. This thing is super cool. Okay, so we have our choice of poking at the thing or poking at controls. Let's poke right. at the thing first. The machine hums softly. An orange glow appears beneath its dark, glossy surface. A large alien symbol dominates the space, with words and a smaller script on the side, but you cannot understand the writing. Even so, it feels like you've seen the writing somewhere before. Yeah, see, I knew we were going to have to do something like this. Okay, let's hold off on this for just a second. Let's go poke at the interface. Yes. The holographic panel appears to be a control interface. In the center is what looks like a utility map of Sagas Cliffs. It's surrounded by a number of symbols that you cannot immediately identify, and in the upper right quadrant is some kind of cube within a cube. Strange as the panel is, you can't shake a strong sense of familiarity about it. Let's look at this a little more closely. The map of Sagas has a number of locations highlighted, some of which you recognize. There are four symbols around it, a circle that looks like the sun, a cluster of stars, a triangle of three eyes, and what looks like a crystal lattice. All the symbols are lit, except for the crystal lattice. Larger than all the four symbols is the cube within a cube, which you suddenly remember is called a tesseract. It appears to be moving. That's a four-dimensional cube. It looked like a cube dust, though, because it cast a three-dimensional shadow. So, what do we think the purpose is of these various interface elements? To try something new. The panel appears to monitor and maintain a network of machines, though the purpose of these networks is still a mystery. Still, you can guess what the symbols mean. The sun probably activates a single location, likely this platform, while the cluster of stars attempts to connect the entire network. The triangle of eyes is to inspect something, perhaps the status of the network. The crystal lattice, you think, indicates repairs. It would probably light up if it was needed. The tesseract is a mystery. It's clearly some kind of toggle, shifting the controls from one state to the other, but without experimentation, you cannot guess at what those two states might be. Let's leave it alone for a second here. Okay, I'd like to read this first, so since we're not going to go back and sleep, as we've established... Is this my only intellect? <laughs> my only intellect heal? <sighs> Alright, I'm going to have to buy some. Okay, so let's go poke at our mystery text first. Okay, so now I've got some points. Let's go 85. Excellent. Ah, excellent. 
After studying the text for several minutes, you begin to see, or perhaps simply remember, patterns in the words. <clears throat> in a flash, the purpose of the device comes back to you. This is an omniscope, a device used to view locations from afar. The large alien symbol is actually an inhuman handprint. The longer list next to it is a set of location names, and the shorter list denotes ranges of time. How far back in time the omniscope should look? You discover that you can actually read them all. Neat. I love this Jacob's Ladder too, by the way. So what locations do we have here? There are eight locations listed, all of them within or near Sagus Cliffs. Selecting one will presumably shift the omniscope to look in that direction. Caravansary is currently selected. That's neat. Let's take a look at the approximate times. There are three numbers here, representing a rough time frame, perhaps days, months, or years. The numbers are strange, but you're fairly certain you understand their meaning. Selecting one would presumably direct the, the omniscope to look at that time frame. The current selection is one, which you take to mean the present. Okay, so let's leave it as is. What happens if I put my hand on it? As soon as you place your hand on the surface, the machine reacts. The glowing items on the two lists blink and draw lines to form a rectangle, a view screen that wasn't there before. A picture shows the plateau of the caravansary. It looks exactly the same. Okay. So then what does this guy do? Guy, what does this thing do? Now we've got some stat points and we can go ahead and try to remember why this feels familiar. 80? Excellent. I think I'm ready to try something new. A memory emerges, as clear as if it were happening to you right now. You are at a cracked door at the base of a stairwell. The door squeaks quietly as you ease it open. Your breath catches in your throat, but the Tabat soldiers outside don't notice you. You squeeze through the door, a keen-eyed young girl behind you, and you slip out of the tower down the blood-stained corridor and into the city. The city is under attack. You dash through the streets to the nearest of your generators. Pressing a couple of buttons, you and the girl are teleported elsewhere. So this is a continuation of the story that we had right in the very, very beginning. When I had my choice of, you know, how I was going to kill the people, and how I shouldered open the door, and cool stuff like that. You find yourself in front of the very same control panel atop the cliff. With quick movements, you shift the tesseract, slipping the controls from space to time. Oh, of course! Then you press the cluster of stars to connect the network of temporal shield generators. On the map, the network of generators bursts to life, sharing energy across the city to create an enormous shield over all of Sagus Cliffs. The dome of energy fills the sky, unmooring the city from time itself. On the other side of the shield, the world shifts and shimmers, objects and landscapes appearing and disappearing before your eyes. The place is the same, you realize, but you're seeing it in many different time periods at once. The important thing is, no one can enter or exit the dome while the city is temporally unmoored. This should buy the city's defenders the space they need to fight off the Tabat and survive. The memory fades. You stand above the caravansary again. The interface is the same as the one from your memory, and you understand what at least some of these controls do. Alright. Okay, let's inspect the current network. The map changes color. Each of the bright points lights up in turn, occasionally stretching a faded line from one point to the other. After a minute of this, the map fades. A voice speaks the truth directly into your mind. Temporal network connections limited. Please repair the network. The crystal lattice next to the light meets up. Okay, let's poke the lattice. Again, the map lights up and changes color. The lines between each point grow and fade. Some of them grow solid and then disappear. Others have gaps in them that will never light up at all. After several minutes, the activity ceases and the voice speaks to you again. Could not restore a network. Temporal connections have deteriorated beyond repair. Please consult your system conservator immediately. You can't raise the shield again like in your memory, but the network once had another purpose, you remember. In the memory, you use the tesseract to shift the controls from time to space. Perhaps if you shifted it back. Perhaps I should. As soon as you touch it, the impossible cubes shift and move with your fingers. It seems to snap in two different states. With unfamiliar gestures, you rotate the tesseract. The inner cube squeezes out and becomes the outer cube, while the outer cube becomes the inner one. Some of the locations lit up on the map changes. Among other locations, two new lights appear in the caravansary, one marking the platform where you're standing. 
The outer cube moves in space, no longer flickering as it was before. Presumably, the controls are now set to the spatial dimension. Cool. Connect to the current network. The bright points on the map grow even brighter, and the platform beneath your feet hums with a growing warmth. Faded lines appear on the map connecting each point, a, a network of machines which this control panel which this patrol this panel controls, including two locations in the caravansary. Then with a loud pop, the humming stops and the map returns to how it was. Let's push the button. What could go wrong? The entire platform hums to life, and a spear of electricity shimmers about five meters above your head. I think I'm ready to try something new. A four-winged bird flaps desperately, trying to avoid the sphere, but its momentum is too great. It hits the sphere, disappearing with a cut-off squawk. Far below in the caravansary, you see the same bird tumble to the ground. It stands up, disorientated, then flaps its wings and takes off again. After a few moments, the humming winds down, the sphere fades, and all is silent again. Huh. Something that I could use it as a teleporter. Okay, let's look at the approximate times. Let's look at the recent past. Access the view screen. Right. Oh, the image in the view screen changes rapidly, showing the caravansary over days and weeks. Travelers come and go, though the ships with the fish-like passengers or goods marked for Mirage Olios remain in their docks for a long time. So what happens if I turn it on now? Ready. So activate it by pushing the button. Comes to life. And it goes away. No. Oh. Alright. So let's look at the distant past here. You touch the number and it glows brighter than the others. The machine's humming changes in timber. Okay. Yes, the caravansary. The image in this view screen changes rapidly, showing the caravansary over many years. The docks have been a bustling center of trade as far back in time as you can see. In the earliest recorded time, you can see two figures standing atop this very observation platform, a male and a female. Bright flashes and gouts of smoke suggest a great battle taking place along the cliffs below, until the man activates something on the control panel. A faint veil of electricity encircles the city, and the tumult suddenly ends. I wonder if we can look into um, the underbelly in the recent past. All right. Maybe see who is killing people. Let's switch to... Oh, the Reef, Circus, Edge, Government Square, Bloom, Crefton. I don't know what these are. Huh. So, does this thing do any different now? Or does this only... Come back here. Get... Thanks for taking me on, lad. Always Shush. good to have a friend watching your back, huh? Now, what can I... Of course. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. So if I set this to a different location, like the reef, for example, so if I activate the... Ah, boy, this is tiny and irritating to push. Huh. All right. Okay, well, let's take a look through this. Each location, though, I'm going to try it again. Oh, let's try it for looking at the present. Yep, see the half-sunken buildings and artifacts of the reef? Okay, now let's see if this does something different. Yes. Maybe I can only teleport now. in the present time. Nope. Hmm. Yes. Now. Well, alright. Let's look at the recent past. You see the half-sunken buildings and artifacts of the Reef of Worlds. The image in the view screen changes rapidly, showing the reef over days and weeks. The most interesting occurrence is the time frame when you fell. There is a bright flash. You can see Allegorn and Castellage watching the sky. Then Allegorn twists his hands in the air, sending multicolored energy up into the sky. Seconds later, a white streak, encased, encased in the same energy, slams into the crystal dome at the edge of the reef. That's me! Let's look at the distant past here. 
It turns on. Look at the view screen. We see the reef. The image in the view screen changes rapidly, showing the reef over many years. The first thing you notice is the construction of a synth dome, the same dome you crashed into when you fell to Earth. A man with a cast-off tattoo works aside various automatons. The cast-off is wearing tattered leather robes. <laughs> An alarming number of wires and, and tubes protrude from his body. Little else changes until you reach the images from many centuries past. Massive war constructs crawl across the reef, firing weapons towards the city above. One of them is struck by a blast from a defensive battery, and it collapses into the crystalline water. As it settles, you realize that you realize its back is the place where you met Koro. Huh. There is nothing before the assault upon the city. When you try and look further into the past, the images loop back to the present and start over. Okay, that's interesting. So, how about Circus Minor? And let's start from the present. Right. Let's look at the view screen. We see Circus Minor. <clears throat> The crowd surrounding the execution ground has dispersed. Yes. Yes, it has. Okay, let's look at the recent past. Yep, we see the bustling city. The image in the view screen changes rapidly, right? You see a vibrant parade. In the center is a man bound in chains. His expression tells you he is walking to his death. Allegorn and Castellige pass, conferring quietly as they make their way toward the steps that lead to the reef. All right. So that's our poor friend getting wandered over to execute. All right, the distant past. Buildings rise and fall as time passes. One in particular catches your attention. It is built from purple rock and rises perfectly straight, perhaps 50 stories tall. On its side is a magnificent, magnificent mural of a creature, or perhaps a tree or a storm, but you feel certain it is a creature. Perhaps the creature, the sorrow that is hunting you. Wow. Oh, I forgot to poke yes. this every time. And does nothing. Yes. That's interesting. Okay. Okay, so we've looked at... Crap. Did I look at Government Square or Cliff's Edge? I think I was looking at Government Square. Dozens of buildings are built into the cliff sides. Many of them hang precariously over the sea below. The people of this area are, for the most part, rough and bitter. They don't live on the edge by choice. Yeah, okay. Buildings. Buildings collapse into the sea quickly, as if something was undermining them. Yeah, who would have done that? Certainly not my new friends, never mind. The further back into the past you look, the more buildings there are. They have been falling gradually into the sea over many centuries. Above and below, there are seaward-facing batteries, defensive weapons that predate the Ninth World, but they too collapse into the seas as the years pass. Shortly before the distant past ends, the last of them topples from its perch, leaving the city defenseless. Hmm. Let's set this back to the present. And go poke at our other thing. All right. Hmm. Why don't you work? Alright. So there's the cliff's edge. Okay, so we've seen the reef, government square, and cliff's edge. Let's look at Circus Minor. Proximate times. The recent past. Or no, wait. Proximate times. Yeah, no, I don't care about the current thing. Look through the viewpoint. You see a bustling city square near the bottom of the cliffs. People of all types mingle around, showing off their wares, or entertain the crowds. Oh, oops. Okay, so that's the one we already did. Sorry. So it was Cliff's Edge that we looked at. Okay, Government Square. Look at the times. The present. The bright sunlit square is home to many elaborate buildings. A few of these are made of metal and seem to burst forth from the ground itself. 
The people here shine as much as the square itself. They are well dressed and obviously wealthy. Many levies walk the square, as well as EM priests, foreigners, and a few non humans. Okay. Recent past. The square. A pale woman with yellow hair stands in front of a magical gateway. Occasionally, you see children enter or exit the portal, although never the same child twice. We saw this. I think we poked at it and couldn't figure it out. Neat. We will go back and look at that. Distant past. Touch the number. I look at it. I think I'm ready Centuries ago, there was some kind of rebellion. It spilled out from the bloom up to the highest parts of Sagas Cliffs. Leading the charge is a woman wielding a glowing hammer. Neat. She is covered entirely in civil scales. She doesn't even have a face that you can see. Her followers are numerous, and the leaders of ancient Sagas are quickly killed or subdued. Cool. Okay, so what we have left here is the Bloom and Grefton. So, let's go ahead and I'm going to take a quick break. Well, it'll be quick for you, maybe not so quick for me. And when we come back, we'll look at the last two locations and then try to figure out what the point is of all this. So, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.